want everyone to be aware of the fact that Democracy Day, which happens on the Tuesday of Voting Day now every year at Stanford, is a student-initiated and, and student-managed uh, program, very far-reaching. And uh, we should be very proud of our, our students, uh, particularly it's the undergraduate students who are organizing this for the initiative they're taking and the extraordinary amount of time they put into it. And secondly, I just wanna say, I know many of you are concerned about the campus climate right now. Um, our panel on October 20th, uh, took place just 13 days after, you know, one of the most horrific terrorist attacks, I think of, uh, of our lifetime, uh, in this case uh, on, uh, on Israel and innocent civilians, over 1400 being killed, which has since uh, of course triggered a very devastating military conflict. Um, we need, <laughs> I think the insights, tools, and commitment from this panel on college campuses uh, now, uh, even more urgently uh, than we did on October 20th. And if we don't find ways to uh, manage our uh, differences and encourage students to explore them and discussing, discuss them, uh, in civil and mutually respectful ways, you know, our, our democracy is really going to be in deep difficulty. Let me say that I agree with Larry and want to thank the organizers of this. And it was indeed a, um, a, uh, a very fruitful dialogue on the panel. And uh, Larry and I have been collaborating on um, methods applying social science to uh, create civil uh, discussion, uh, civil evidence-based discussions. We call it applications of deliberative democracy, and that will figure in our responses to the, um, our reactions to the panel and some of the things that we have to offer. And we have also tried that uh, at the university level, at the global, uh, at the near global level, in fact, and in countries around the world. And, um, it has uh, with some very surprising results, but I'll come back to that, uh, or Larry and I will come back to that. And I think uh, the most fruitful way to use our time is to look at the um, uh, clips, uh, the excerpts from the um, panel that um, uh, the team uh, selected, and then Larry and I can react to those. As a professor of constitutional law, one of the things that is distinctive about the U.S. Constitution is how old it is and how little it has been changed, and the ways in which our country has adapted over time certainly have involved amendments, but also that civic culture. And it is that participation by people in the life of government and engagement uh, that really has sustained the Constitution and has enabled it to adapt over time. And that level of civic engagement, I think, is required to ensure that those systems of checks and balances uh, and limitations on government are in place appropriately to constrain government power, but don't render the system unworkable. Don't make it such that we can't get anything done. And that requires participation of, of the citizenry. You know, if I could just, uh, on that point, I do think the Constitution has been remarkable in the degree to which change has been possible within it. Uh, if you think about the United States as a slaveholding state when it was originally founded, um, I have a little, a little story that I often tell, which is that, uh, of course, I'm, my ancestors were slaves. Uh, my ancestors were also slave owners. We have to remember that about slavery. Uh, but I was being sworn in as Secretary of State, um, and it, you're sworn in in the Benjamin Franklin room. And it's a huge portrait of Benjamin Franklin above you. And while I was being sworn in, I thought to myself, I wonder what old Ben would think of this, right? <laughs> you've, got, you've got this black woman, uh, descendant of slaves, and actually she's being sworn in by a Jewish woman Supreme Court justice named Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Now, Ben, uh, you know... So, so Ben, Gen so as it turns out, um, Ben Franklin is my favorite founding father, isn't he? Everybody's favorite founding father, maybe Alexander Hamilton. But, but I thought, 
oh, he would have loved it. He would have loved it. But the truth is he would never have imagined it, right? And so, frankly, neither would have I imagined it growing up in segregated Birmingham. I don't think Ruth would have imagined it when she was trying to get her voice heard in law school. And so I agree, we need to keep improving it. But I get nervous when people talk about improving it outside of the context, not you, but I, yeah. I hear this, outside of the context of uh, what a constitution that's actually served us uh, pretty well, largely because, and you know this, Jenny, uh, Americans have this spirit of constitutionalism. We kind of think of the Constitution as our personal protector. So if I think you have, uh, have abridged my rights, I will take you all the way to the Supreme Court under Constitution. So uh, I, I think we do have to keep improving, but we've got a pretty terrific framework through which to do it. First of all, how inspiring to have these two institutional leaders and to have had the opportunity to, to be on stage with uh, Jenny Martinez and, and Condoleezza Rice. On the specifics, uh, I'd just like to say that um, because our constitution is the oldest um, democratic constitution of a significant nation state in the world, um, it is outmoded, uh, many people think, uh, in some respects. Uh, and uh, the electoral system is kind of archaic compared to what most democracies have been gravi gravitating to. Um, the uh, lack of, um, you know, uh, federal institutions for um, overseeing uh, and punishing uh, transgressions of ethics in the Congress and the Supreme Court, one could go on and on. But a lot of the changes that people want to see to modernize American democracy, uh, in fact, most of them can happen without constitutional amendments. And in our most recent deliberative poll, American One Room Democratic Reform, which we did in June, the deliberative democracy lab that Jim leads and that I collaborate in, we got some very encouraging responses and some very encouraging changes uh, in terms of Americans uh, uh, moving toward embracing certain types of um, political reforms and electoral reforms that, would, that might depolarize and improve our democracy, but that wouldn't require a constitutional amendment. Uh, yes, we did. And uh, I just want to add that um, we have the most, we have the oldest continuing written constitution and the one that is most, arguably the most difficult to change in a formal way. Article five requires two thirds uh, vote of both houses of Congress and three quarters of the states ratifying it, which means it's almost impossible to get a constitutional amendment. But the Constitution changes informally outside of Article V all the time through reinterpretations of the Constitution. Um, and sometimes that's connected to our politics. That's called uh, popular constitutionalism, where groups mobilize to get their people appointed to the courts, including the Supreme Court. And we've had some very major changes, as you know, about uh, uh, about um, the right to bear arms. I mean, the the Second Amendment was only applied to to individuals rather than militias as recently as um, uh, uh, I think two thousand and eight, uh, and uh, the Heller decision. And uh, the you've got uh, the abortion change. Well, these are produce strains on the on the when people. Uh, either get rights or have rights taken away, it produces uh, strains in our collective understanding. And Condi uh, Rice uh, mentioned Ben Franklin. He's most he's among his most famous quips was coming out of the Constitutional Convention, and he was asked. Uh, uh, remember that was a time when when the idea of the people self governing was uh, a novel idea, and he was asked. Mr. Franklin, what will it be, a monarchy or a republic? And he said, a republic, if you can keep it. And the key thing is what we have to do to keep it. And that builds on the whole point about civic engagement and collective discussion and people getting involved 
in the ways in which we can uh, change not just the Constitution, but our laws and provide thoughtful input into the political process uh, and not stay home on Election Day. Uh, so um, there's a lot more that we'll talk about with the democratic reform process, but uh, I thought this was a good setup for the conversation. What recommendations do you have for our U.S. leaders about trying to bridge the divide? Well, try to bridge the divide. Um, <laughs> I think that um, a compromise is built into the fabric of democracy. Uh, Madison talked about constant contestation, and at some point, uh, we will come to a conclusion on something, but I'm not your enemy. Uh, I won this one, you might win the next one, and we move on. And I'm saddened to see that I was talking to a friend who was doing a, working in a campaign in Pennsylvania, and I said, when is the last time that a candidate actually said, here's what I'm going to do, rather than here's what I'm going to stop them from doing? And somehow it's become so adversarial and so much about uh, pushing the other person into the corner. But sometimes as I'm going through this, I actually blame us more than I blame them. Because that's a response to what they believe is, um, shall we say, career enhancing, is to behave in that way. And uh, we all say we want our politicians to compromise and we want them to take on hard questions and we want them to do something about entitlements because we all went, and then we vote them out of office if they do. So what are they supposed to do? And so I, I think somehow uh, the great mass of uh, Americans have got to start uh, to model in our voting behavior that actually just dividing and conquering is not career enhancing. And maybe we'll get a little bit better uh, reaction from our leaders. I will say one thing, the founding fathers were really smart about one other thing. We tend to focus on Washington, but if you go down to the states, partly because governors have to pass balanced budgets, very often they have to reach across the aisle and work with legislators who are of different party, you will find that they are problem solvers more than perhaps in, in the federal government. And so as you get down the levels of government, I think you find more of what we would hope democracy looks like. And so when I wanna feel good about democracy, I think about what the states are doing. You wanna start, Jim? Okay. Um, well, I agree with uh, uh, Condi's aspirations are, uh, after all, uh, when uh, Madison envisioned uh, the Senate, he didn't, and the whole scheme that we have, he wasn't even thinking about political parties. Political parties came as a surprise, and George Washington's farewell address was that he was worried that the spirit of party was going to distort the whole process because the legislators were supposed to make decisions, deliberate on the merits of the issues. Um, and so uh, then later, Madison, to deal with it, went off and founded a political party, but that was later co-founded. The, the aspiration for compromise on the issues is essential. The trouble is our political incentives have changed due to the unexpected consequences of well-meaning political reforms like those that were, many of them hatched in California, primary referendum recall, the whole pro progressive era. The, the, uh, uh, the people worry about being primaried. And so they have to listen to those who are to the primary electorates rather than the uh, general election uh, electorate. And so um, uh, their incentives may be to raise money, to raise visibility, and to speak to the base. The trouble is so, but there are adjustments. There could be open rather than closed primaries. We could get rid of sore loser laws so that people could run as independents if they lose the primary. We could have ranked choice voting. There are a lot of these things that we included in our agenda of reforms that could adjust the incentives for uh, members of Congress uh, and the Senate uh, and the House both to, um, to uh, um, uh, really vote their convictions uh, on the merits and uh, not be bullied by the loudest voices. And as for the states, it's a great aspiration again for the states to be the laboratories of democracy as they often were and have been and are to some degree now. But 
uh, many of the state legislatures are gerrymandered. And it's not just, it's both parties are gerrymandering. And the results are the uh, state legislative elections and the congressional elections often don't represent um, the public uh, distribution of votes. Uh, and uh, we ought to, so one of the reforms that um, in our uh, deliberative poll where we had a national sample of the whole country deliberating for a whole weekend and getting their questions answered based on good information and then coming to conclusions, one of the big changes was the uh, support for nonpartisan redistricting commissions, uh, which would be a reasonably effective way of dealing with uh, gerrymandering so that everybody's vote would have a better chance of counting and we wouldn't have these manipulative uh, districts, the, the uh, crazy gerrymandered districts that are designed to um, ensure that whichever party happens to be in control of the um, legislature at the time of the redistricting uh, can, uh, can stack the deck. Uh, so I think we need to restore uh, electoral integrity um, to the system and it will help restore confidence in it. Yes, um, uh, I agree. Uh, let me add the following. Uh, I think that, um, well, I have reservations about direct democracy and the degree to which it can be abused. Uh, we've certainly seen that degree in California from time to time. Uh, I think we're seeing that the voter initiative has actually become a very important tool for voters to mobilize to get reforms on the ballot at the state level that can make our democracy work better. And one of the reforms that um, has been adopted that I think is promising is precisely the one that uh, Jim uh, just referred to, which is nonpartisan redistricting commissions. If we can get rid of extreme partisan gerrymandering it won't be a miracle, but we will get fair political outcomes in the United States, and we will get more congressional and state legislative districts that are more competitive, that aren't uh, just kind of uh, guaranteed for one political party or the other. And while there's not a mechanical relationship here, I do think it's the case that when people are running in partisan, in competitive par, uh, districts in partisan terms that are kind of in the middle and could go either way, um, they tend to be a little bit more moderate and compromising in their voting behavior because they need to recruit votes from the other side. Now, let me say in addition that uh, I see our problem of unwillingness to compromise and extreme partisan polarization as partially being driven by the incentive structures in our political system. And Jim referred to what I think is the most uh, serious and troubling one, which is the fear on the part of members of Congress, for example, that if they compromise, um, if they reach agreements with the other political party, if they move to the middle uh, on some very hot button issues or on questions of funding this or that uh, and depart from what is presumed to be party orthodoxy on both sides of the aisle, by the way, they could have a more orthodox, a more puritanical, a challenger in their party primary who could defeat them. And this has struck a lot of fear in members of Congress and probably some state legislatures who actually personally have better and more accommodating instincts and realize how much trouble we're in. One reason why I like the combination of ranked choice voting and nonpartisan primaries, which is the combination that was adopted by the state of Alaska through a voter initiative in uh, 2020 and um, that helped to return one of the Republican senators who's willing to compromise, Lisa Murkowski, to the Senate to be reelected in 2022. Um, 
and the same uh, reform called top four, top five in Alaska, it's top four in Nevada, top five uh, was it was adopted in the first round. It needs to be adopted twice by voter initiative because it's a constitutional amendment. Uh, the way this system works is you have a nonpartisan primary. The top four candidates in Alaska would be the top five in Nevada advanced to the general election and then ranked choice voting is used with an instant runoff to ensure that whoever gets elected in the final round has majority support. I like this system because it preserves the electoral prospects of people who take a risk to compromise and pursue workable government uh, and some degree of moderation. Uh, so I think it is precisely the voter initiative that is uh, creating room for the pursuit of these kinds of political reforms. We can go to the next uh, segment. So Thanksgiving dinner's coming up for uh -huh. all of us. <laughs> <laughs> I know there's certain topics with my family that we just now stay away from, but how do we start talking about that again, Larry? I know that you uh, abide by something called trigger words or trigger conversation. What do you mean by that? Well, um, when people walked into our small groups, whether in person or online, after having read our uh, briefing papers, some of the words they did not encounter in the briefing papers were Republican, Democrat, Trump, Obama, and Biden. <laughs> um, so, I mean, it, it's pretty obvious. Uh, try not to wear the most polarizing signals on your forehead, <laughs> you know. Start and, and try to look for common ground. You know, we all have we all exist in a universe where we have a, a, a kind of circle of opinion, uh, sentiment, beliefs, things we value, and then the family member maybe you've grown distant from or are in tension with or the neighbor or whatever, they have a circle as well. Almost always, there's some shaded area in what we call the Venn diagram when you look at those two circles so be, beyond avoiding the obvious triggers, my advice is try and do a little mental analysis of that Venn diagram. You probably know, you know, your relative, your, your father, whatever it might be, well enough to imagine some of that and start by building out from what you share in common and, and try and inch out from that to see how you can uh, maybe think about certain issues where some of the underlying values you do share in common can be activated. So that's one piece of advice. Sometimes on the stuff that's most polarizing, you know, don't go there. <laughs> Change the subject. Talk about where you can find some common ground. Well, I th it's not surprising that I think you were absolutely right. Um, but I think that um, the uh, getting people to listen to other people, but also having some way of uh, dealing with uh, contested facts where, I mean, if you just present uh, people with a position they disagree with, you're gonna trigger a, uh, a negative response. And if you, uh, 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 discuss the issues all in terms of party uh, labels and loyalties, you're just going to trigger partisanship or a kind of team spirit. For democracy to work, people have to think about the substance of the issues rather than just which team is going to profit from them. Uh, and so to do that, uh, we disentangled the the, the uh, party positions. We didn't mention any party positions, or we tend not to in any of our projects. We try to see if we can get um, uh, deliberative citizens and deliberative voters who really weighed the merits of the issues. Most people, most of the time, don't have the uh, time to think in depth about the issues, so they rely on their party loyalties and other cues about uh, uh, how uh, uh, they think they ought to respond. 
But democracy really requires an active citizenship. And um, bringing that to life is the point of a liberal education. And it's the point of, uh, it's something that we expect from citizens at least close to elections. A lot of our political science colleagues uh, around the country have come to the conclusion that that's just a myth. Uh, uh, two prominent ones call it a folk theory of democracy, that uh, that it's uh, just totally unrealistic and that citizens are not capable of it. Well, we've done projects all over the world where we know the citizens are capable of it if they think they're uh, if they think they'll be listened to and that their voice matters. And so this is what we have to encourage, uh, thinking about the issues independent of party labels. And then often people are surprised about how much they can agree. Uh, and we have some examples of that. Great. Um, you know, I have in the last two, three weeks with the eruption of this new arena of intense emotional uh and political polarization on our campuses, uh, been spending time talking to people who do conflict management and conflict resolution for a living. And a lot of the depolarization work they do, I think is very aligned with um, our system, uh, our methodology of uh, deliberative polling and deliberation in small groups. But uh, some of it isn't focused on policy issues. It's just focused on reducing what uh, we call in our work, Jim, myself, other political and social scientists, affective polarization, emotional and psychological enmity or distance between uh, different uh, groups of people. And one of the themes I've kept hearing uh, from the work of these people. I was just recently talking to the leader of an excellent conflict resolution organization that does international uh, work uh, in post-Civil War and other highly uh, polarized contexts called Search for Common Ground. Uh, and now they're uh, doing work on college campuses in the US as well with some of their different organizational partners and you can see some of their initiatives and ideas or find a portal to them on a website called campus unite all one word dot org in any case um uh they have found that uh two very important uh fundamentals for transcending our polarization and beginning to detoxify our social and political environment are enabling people to be heard and to be respected. And by the way, uh, Jim, I was struck by the fact that when they organize discussions, it's with the same size groups, small groups that we have in our <laughs> polling, it's 10 to 12 people. Mm -hmm. And it's a similar thing, they bring them together for say 90 minute to two hour sessions, four to eight times. So it's these are two independent efforts that are remarkably similar in a lot of their methods. And so I would just add to what I said on stage there, we have to find ways to, and echo what Jim said, to really listen to one another um, in an open-minded way uh, and to emerge from the interaction with mutual respect. We can go on. So the idea of deliberative democracy and a method I have called deliberative polling is to see what the people would think, would really think if they thought about an issue together and if they had access to good information, if they got their questions answered, but mostly if they listened to each other in a civil way. Um, and so we take national random samples or the sample of a city or a state or whatever, and we've done 130 of these projects around the world where we take a sample and we bring it together either physically or uh, online. We have, with computer scientists here, we've developed a special platform that makes it really uh, much less expensive and easy for people to deliberate um, uh, and see each other in small groups. So 
the uh, 500 people up to 1,000 people. We did 1,000 people with climate change in the US um, recently. Um, they deliberate in these small groups and they work through the issues, pros and cons of different proposals. Um, they, uh, they think about them. They, and we have a survey at the beginning and a survey at the very end of the process. And sometimes the changes are remarkably uh, dramatic, uh, 40 points. Uh, so it shows what was lying behind. Very often initial views that you see in polls uh, are just an impression of sound bites and headlines, or they may not even exist because uh, people don't like to say they don't know. So a late friend of mine, George Bishop, did studies about the Public Affairs Act of 1975, which people had views about or answered, but it was fictional. There was no Public Affairs Act in 1975. <laughs> so, so some of, the, some of the polling results you see are like that. Uh, but then some of them are just a wisp of information, you know, headlines, uh, impressions. But what would people really think? So we've been doing these now for a number of years, but what surprised us in this age of extreme partisan polarization, uh, because we've done several projects where we found the same thing, is that when people deliberate together, not only do you get an estimate of what the people together really would think, but you also depolarize. They come, they move much closer together. The divisions are, um, uh, are greatly diminished and a way forward is clarified. So we're also now experimenting with ways to try to spread this kind of deliberative process to the broader society. Do you want to comment, Larry? Well, uh, <laughs> I, I said too much. I didn't know they were going to have such a long clip. I'll say a couple things. Number one, um, Jim developed this method, uh, what, I guess, in the beginning of his thinking more than 30 years ago, after studying uh, from a political theory standpoint, the phenomenon of um, of democratic deliberation. And uh, I'm a latecomer here in collaborating with him uh, in now the Deliberative Democracy Lab, which is uh, sits within uh, our democracy center at the Freeman Spogli Institute. And in this amazing project, American One Room, uh, and we've worked together on some overseas uh, deliberations and I'll just say, I, I've just been astonished to see the transformations. The percentage of people who said they were satisfied with the way democracy is working, uh, going into the uh, deliberative poll we did in June on democratic reform in the United States, the percentage of de democratically satisfied people was just maybe a little over 20%. And going out of the deliberation, all they did between the, the, the survey they took before the deliberation and the survey they did after the deliberation was deliberate. But the percentage of, of people say, saying they were satisfied with the state of American democracy increased from a little over 20% to nearly half or around half. And for Republicans, I think it went from 18 to 52%. So I think there is the potential not only to reduce polarization and to identify common policy ground in some cases, and have this be a tool potentially for policy guidance, but also a tool when people come to see that their fellow citizens are not evil. Um, they just have different views and maybe some of their information is incorrect, but they can find common ground. They do feel better about democracy and that can be extremely valuable for making democracy work better. Well, I agree with that. And I've been very happy to teach this undergraduate, this freshman course with Larry for a number of years called The Spirit of Democracy. And for me, part of the spirit of democracy, which um, we have foregrounded and may not have been as prominent in the earlier versions when 
Larry used that title for his book, was deliberation. The people thinking together uh, is part of the spirit of democracy because the whole point of democracy, in my view, is to make some connection between the will of the people and what's actually done. So to the extent that you can help uncover the will of the people from this welter of misinformation and enclaves where uh, people only hear half or one part of the discussion, when you can open them up to hear the other part and the, the facts and arguments on the other side and weigh them, then you can reveal the, the, the uh, uh, viewpoints that don't have much merit, but the ones that do. And you can often discover that there's some point to the things that other people are getting exercised about. And the result is we don't push a consensus, but we discover the, if there is a consensus, we discover it in confidential questionnaires. So Larry and I have been working together also on uh, uh, initiatives to try to scale the deliberative process, which is why we now have this machine uh, called the Stanford Online Deliberation Platform. My uh, friends at other universities, particularly at Harvard, have said, you can't call it that. Come up with another name for it. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, that's what we haven't we haven't come up with another name for it. But it moderates the discussions. And we've actually done even global deliberations with thousands and thousands of people uh, who uh, it it inter it uh, has a little bit of AI. It intervenes if people are being uncivil to each other. It can work in any language and it divides the people into small groups of 10. And so for a deliberative poll, we need a good sample. But for what I call what we're calling deliberative scaling, we're hoping to spread the deliberative process through civic groups and uh, uh, maybe other ways to get people, the mass of society actually deliberating because it has benefits in terms of efficacy, people being interested, becoming more informed, and also even voting in a way that where they make a connection between their considered judgments and their uh, uh, their policy preferences and their voting preferences. And that's what democracy ought to be about. So we're hoping to, to instill deliberation beyond the samples, but the samples tell us something about how people can get together on contentious issues. And that's, I think, uh, will help break the deadlock and help rehabilitate the public will formation in our democracies. Um, maybe the next clip, whatever it is. I'll say something great about our Stanford students. I, I think it's easy when you look in the news media or online to think that all young people don't want to hear ideas they disagree with, uh, don't understand the value of the things we've been talking about. And I think it's another example of where you hear the loudest voices amplified on social media and in the news. And I would say, from my experience with our students in the classroom and on campus, that actually the great majority of our students are eager to engage with ideas, um, to learn more about the world, and to grapple with their disagreements. And so I actually think that when you get down on the ground, that there is a lot more reason for optimism about this generation and about our students than you would see from reading the newspaper. Yeah. yeah. I completely agree with that. It's the most public-minded generation that I've taught in all these years of teaching. I will say this, I do have to say to them, you actually don't have a constitutional right not to be offended. <laughs> and we need to keep reminding them that uh, sometimes conversations are hard. I just say one other thing, you know, there are 330 million Americans, about 256 million are adults. If each and every one of us actually tried to practice what we keep saying we want, which is we re will reach across, we will talk to people who are different, we won't fly off the handle, uh, it might be a different conversation. And if every time you get a chance to ask a political leader a question, why not ask them that question? Mm -hmm. uh, why are you sowing discord? Uh, do you believe in compromise and see what you get? I'll, I'll turn it over to Larry in a second, but I just wanted to say the work that we do I mean, Larry and I are taking a lot of credit, but our, the work that we do is really powered by Stanford undergraduates and some graduate students. 
we, my colleague, Dr. Alice Hsu, the associate director of our lab, who collaborates with Larry and me, has a practicum and also a whole army of Stanford students who do all these projects. And they are so clever and inventive and energetic that we compete with, uh, uh, we, we're able to do projects all over the world cost effectively at a high level of competence. And we're only able to pay the students what Stanford permits us to pay uh, research assistants, uh, which gives us a tremendous cost advantage because these people are so talented and they're so enthusiastic. So it's the energy of the uh, Stanford students that allows us to compete with, with all kinds of organizations around the world. And because they're interested in helping to reform democracy. So, uh, and of course they sometimes write senior theses or papers about this stuff too, and it's part of their education. So I just wanted to put that in and give Larry the last word because then apparently we're coming to an end. Yeah, thank you, Jim. We're, we're just about at time now. So uh, let me say that I strongly uh, agree with what our uh, provost, Jenny Martinez, uh, observed. Um, I think the students are not as polarized in their actual opinions or resistant to seeking out different points of view uh, as they are uh, caricatured as being. And part of the reason is that it's the most, as is typically the case, the most militant students um, whose voices are heard and who capture the news headlines and so on. We've had a lot of students um, flowing into the Hoover Institution uh, wanting to be research assistants, actually previously had wanted to take courses with Condi when she was teaching them and uh, working for H.R. McMaster in our China program and so on. Many of these students, they're not conservative, they're not Republicans, they just um, are interested in policies and want to interact with people um, who've been in the political arena and been in the policy making realm from different points of view. Uh, so I think there's a lot we can do in this regard. I will close the way I began by saying our campus and other campuses uh, in the United States are very emotionally charged uh, and tense right now because of this conflict in the Middle East and underlying identity divisions. But I, uh, I know just from talking to Jewish and Muslim students in the last 24 hours, that there's a lot of desire to bridge the div divisions too. Uh, and so this is partly on us to uh, provide the circumstances, the encouragement and the modeling of behavior that will enable that to happen.